Hello. Set commander. Wait. We have Asaf and Akshay and Mainak. Hello? Daddy, you're on mute. Bradley, I guess you're muted. Yeah. Uh, my, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Alright, hello. Uh, Hi. Hi. Uh, we might wait for a minute or two for people to show up. Uh, and then we'll get on with the meeting. So how's everyone doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Good. Hello, Dick. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, Maynak, how are you doing with your uh, community period? Are you coming along with it? Yes, as of now, it's, it's actually going well. Okay, yeah, I know we've exchanged some messages in Slack about it. Um, yeah, and it looks like you're doing pretty well. Um, yeah, yeah, so let's see, I guess. Uh, yeah, let me start with some community things. I know people aren't really here yet, but we'll get on with that part of it. And then Mainak can give his presentation on what he's in his project and what he's been up to in the last maybe week or two. So, uh, as you know, Mainak is the uh, GSOC student for this year, and he'll be working on the uh, uh, Devo Learn project. So, congratulations to Mainak. And so one of the things that they do in GSOC is to have a community period, which is to get uh, acquainted with the uh, organization that you're working with. So this organization is uh, actually OpenWorm. So, you know, we, we apply through INCF, but OpenWorm is our sponsoring organization. So we have our Slack, OpenWorm Slack, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we have in the community period. Uh, and you can follow along with this. I just wanted to promote some of our community resources uh, yes. during this time. And this, this community period lasts for three weeks. So we're in week two of the community period. So um, a lot of times the students will want to get a head start on understanding their project, and that's great. Uh, but there are also other resources that we have and so I'm going to share my screen and go over some of those now. So I've been doing this for a couple of years. And uh, one of the things that we've done, um, so let's see. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we've gone over the different materials, getting people uh, integrated into OpenWorm. So of course we have the Slack, but we also have all the other projects that are going on. So we're DevoWorm here. And that's a developmental uh, oriented project. And so we did this open house in 2016. And so it's a little bit dated, but I think that the basic uh, information still holds here. So uh, we have different projects that are going on in open worms. So we have movement validation. We have Geppetto C302, which are actually two projects, but we have, uh, they're kind of feed off of one another. Uh, a lot of simulation, uh, nervous system simulation, worm simulation uh, in that group. Um, then there's worm sim, which is another initiative. Uh, we have, uh, oh, okay, so some of these are not really projects, but then we have Sci Unit, which is a unit testing initiative. Um, and then we have Cybernetic, which is a, a biophysical simulation platform. It was developed by uh, some people in Siberia who work with the project. And I'll kind of go through all of these different projects um, as we go. So these are just some of the projects, actually, because, uh, you know, some of the projects, some of the other projects that aren't featured here um, are sort of side initiatives. Uh, we have people looking at muscle modeling and other types of uh, things having to do with the worm. So, uh, you know, check out, if, if you want to get um, more involved in this, you can actually look at this repository here. This was from 2016, as I said, and this is the, um, these are this, these are presentations and, and source materials that we had for each project. 
And then if you want to sort or look through the uh, open worm uh, Slack channels, we have certain Slack channels that might be of interest as well. Um, so we have the little projects and then we have uh, the badge system, which is sort of our educational system. So we have different badges on movement uh, or our Docker container or um, muscle modeling, things like that, that, uh, you know, you might, you know, go through the badge and complete it. So basically you have to go through the set of exercises, submit something, and then you're approved, and then you get the badge. And it's just a little micro-credential, but you can learn a lot about some of these things um, as you go along. So, um, and then of course, uh, there were, in this open house that we had, there were two tutorials. There was a first tutorial on Morphozoic, which is the platform that uh, Tom Portagy's developed, and he's in, in the group. He was here a couple weeks ago, and this is a, a cellular automata model of development or a pattern a pattern production, uh, but you know you can apply it to development uh, and cell modeling, which is a common theme in open in open worm. We focus on modeling cells. Um, so that was something that uh, I think Stephen Larson uh, put on as a tutorial for, you know, how to model cells. And he's actually been pretty successful at creating a, uh, a startup related to like uh, biological data and cell modeling and things like that in, in um, neuroscience data. So his PhD is in neuroinformatics. And so that was his, that's his area. So that's, I wanted to talk about that. That's one way to get acquainted with Open Worm. Another way is to go into the uh, history of Open Worm and think about what was happening 10 years ago. And it tur as it turns out, um, the Open Worm uh, Foundation started as a project about 10 years ago, this coming September. So uh, if you wonder, ever wondered where the origins of Open Worm come from, uh, we, we actually had in the Slack, we had a discussion about like someone asked, when is the 10th anniversary of Open Worm? And so there's a page on the wiki or on the in the docs of Open Worm. And uh, I don't know if this is it or not. Okay, this is the other thing. Um, so there's a page in the docs uh, on the history. It's I think it's full history or something like that. And the full history gives all these dates. So this is from the full history doc page. And this is, uh, so back in 2010, uh, Giovanni Adili, uh, who's pictured here, and Stephen Larson kind of made calls in parallel for involvement in this, you know, we want to model the worm. We want to create this model of C. elegans because C. elegans was already a, a well-known model organism. And so they wanted to do something that was, you know, a computational sort of analog of that. So they were kind of working independently. Giovanni's in London and, uh, uh, Stevens in Boston, or I guess at the time, I don't know where he was, but um, he has, you know, he has a lot of connections in Boston. Um, they're kind of doing this separately. They come together and then they start recruiting people. And so, um, so 2010 goes by, then 2011, we go into 2011, Giovanni discovers cyber elegance. So these are the people in, in uh, Siberia. So they call it like I think they called it like cyber with an S because it's in Siberia. Uh, Andre and Sergey, and they developed these. They de decided to join forces with Open Worm. They got the uh, cybernetic project component into Open Worm. So there were a lot of different components that started to come together around 2010, 2011, and uh, so this is uh, you know again. There are other people who are involved in this, um, Matteo and other people. And you'll meet these people if you look around the Slack, you'll see them in the general channel, for example. Um, and then so then they started to produce articles. So this one came in September, Managing Complexity in Multi-Algorithmic Multi-Scale Biological Simulations, an Integrated Software Engineering, engineering and Neuroinformatics Approach. So Open Worm really has its roots in software engineering and neuroinformatics. Uh, and this is where kind of where a lot of what we do comes from. 
um, but we have our own interests. So uh, it's, you know, it's interesting. I actually joined along with uh, Dick and I started this group back in 2014. So we were a bit late to the open worm game, but we're still pretty, uh, you know, uh, still fairly early given where we are now. But the date I think we should remember here is that September 2011, Open Worm Release 1 happened. So there was a formal release of Open Worm uh, that happened in September 2011. So that's probably the date that will be used for the 10th anniversary. And then as you can see, 2012, 2013, you get these new releases. You get a journal club that starts. You get an Open Worm conference in Paris that happens in 2013. We had another uh, similar conference in London in 2018 on um, sort of hosted by the Royal Society. So, you know, there's Open Worm's done a lot in, in 10 years. And this was a response I got here in the Slack channel. This discussion kind of came up with this. This is the full history uh, from this, the same thing I showed you. And Giovanni responded, that's pretty accurate. One year before that, we were throwing the idea around on Twitter. We started getting on Skype calls only weeks before finding cyber elegance. And that's when we met Ape, uh, Andre and Sergey, uh, them feels. So he... You know, this is like, it, it, it's worth mentioning that there were a number of projects before Open Worm that were sort of failed projects, um, or maybe they didn't really go as far as Open Worm in trying to model C. elegans. So, I mean, there, there, there have been attempts at this before, and uh, Open Worm has kind of stuck with it for through about 10 years. So hopefully, you know, in the next 10 years, there will be some sort of... Uh, really good big big things happening um but we'll see so let's see in the chat we have uh, dick said predecessor this is cyber worm this is something that dick uh cited in his book i don't know what uh cyber where cyber the origins of cyber worm but this is the link here this is i think in his book or but yeah there were predecessor uh groups and um, so I wanted to go through that history because a lot of times you'll see people say, uh, make the public perception is, is either that it's dead, open worm is dead, or that it's like this sort of thing that happen, you know, happens along the lines of the singularity, uh, which is to say it's not really <laughs> based in doing like science. It's kind of like this visionary thing that, you know, um, so, so, you know, I just wanted to give a good little history. I think... For the 10th anniversary, we should probably try to do something. Uh, we'll be chatting over the summer in the, amongst the senior contributors, and maybe we'll see where that leads. But maybe people, if you're interested in something, doing something for the 10th anniversary, we can do things like, you know, um, really kind of promote some of the ideas that have been developed in Open Worm and see where we can take some of those. We can do blog posts or maybe even we'll do a paper on you know, I don't know, I haven't talked to anyone about this, but like, you know, some sort of 10th anniversary paper. It's always hard getting that coordinated, but, you know. Um, so, hello, Shruti and Ujwal. You're also here. So that's, uh, that was just my short introduction. Now I would like for um, my knock to come up and, or to share his screen and present on what he's been up to in the last two weeks. Maybe his uh, vision for what he's going to do this summer. Yeah, so I'll share my screen. Okay. So just let me know if it's visible, right? Okay. Okay, so yeah. is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, so I'll get started with the presentation. Okay. So, so my presentation is essentially about the community bonding period, about the upgrading devolent project, which is project 3.1 for this year's GSOC. So I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so for a quick recap, a devolent is basically, it's basically a collection of uh, computational learning models, which are used to accelerate uh, developmental biology research. And it's actually mainly focused on the embryogenesis of C. elegans. So my was the one, Mayuk and Ujwal, I guess. So these two were the ones who started this project last year in their GSOC project. And now it has its own 
GitHub repository and also it has been and it also actually has a, a PyPy package of its own. So, okay, so that leads me to this slide which which talks about the goals of my project which is project 3.1. So the major goals for this project would be to upgrade the existing uh, to upgrade the existing models that we have and to improve the usability then to add some more useful models and plus we'll also try to get some interactive online demos and maybe even work on a GUI which would be great I guess. So plus uh, after the coding period like I don't think I'll be I'll start after the coding period begins because I was thinking of starting the blog post in this week itself but from next week onwards I'll be uploading my uh, like it would be like a detailed blog post in my uh, website which is linked here so okay so the goals for this community for this community bonding period okay so the four major goals for this period for me would be to interact with the mentors and the members of the community then to clear out the uncertainty the uncertainties in the project and then i'll also try to read some more of the publications that are out there to gather more knowledge about the about the biology and the fourth point is to discuss my approach with the with the mentors and the co-mentors so yeah Okay, so community at the heart of every open source project, and I guess I guess the community is what has uh, driven this project so far. So the beauty of this open form of work is that anybody could join in and they could make contributions to it. And this project has attracted users and uh, contributors from around the globe, and the community is actually growing pretty pretty well since the last year, and that's that's I guess good news. And if and if anyone wants to start any uh, discussions, they could start it in the GSOC 21 channel in the Open World Slack workspace. So, so before I end, I actually wanted to touch upon the the coming deadlines that we have. So June 7th is when the community bonding period ends and the coding period starts, and July 12th is when the phase 1 evaluation will happen and August 16th is when the final submission deadline is. And uh, feel free to suggest changes and additions to the project even if they require me to work uh, well beyond these deadlines because they are there to just keep track of my work but like I will I'll, like I am sure I will have time to work even further from these deadlines. So. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my presentation and I guess thank you for, uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> we have some, uh, well, we have some links in here. Um, yeah, Ojoel says, congrats, Manok. Uh, yeah. And then I think we have some more, st I'll, I'll get to the cyber room stuff in a minute, but um so yeah, I had a couple of comments on that. The first is that uh, let's see, uh, go back a couple slides maybe. Uh, okay, yeah, that's all right. Go forward a couple slides. Okay. Uh, next one. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So this is the structure basically. We uh, kind of wrapping up community period stuff this week, and then getting into coding and sort of hitting the ground, uh, running, and then you, do you, yeah. so do you have a plan of what you're going to do first and second and so forth? Yeah, exactly. That's what this is. Oh, okay. So you don't know, well, I mean, you had a, uh, sort of a schedule that you made for your, uh, uh, present for your proposal. So what are you yes, planning to yes. do first, at least according to that timeline? So according to that timeline, the first thing would be to actually like to get some feedback from you, Mayuk and Ujwal regarding like regarding the project and the existing code. And I've actually been talking to Mayuk for the past week, like to just clear up my approach and what sort of the loopholes that he thinks that should be fixed first. 
So that's what I've been doing. Okay. And so that's that'll be good uh, just to sort of yeah. zero in on things that need to be done. Uh, and so, yeah, just keep in contact with yeah, so. us uh, about, like, things that, I mean, it, you do have the sort of the timeline from what you wanted to do, you know, but, of course, those timelines will change quite a bit over, you know, as, as the project uh, develops. And you've, you've had a couple of things in the Slack. Uh, it, do you have your Slack open? Could you bring that? Or I don't know if you want to show that. You had some yeah, results. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll just share it uh, once again. Okay. Uh, just to add, like, uh, we can also make a uh, group, right, for the GSOC uh, student, like we do every year. Whether it is in student will be there so that he can, uh, um, you know, one message he can share the progress with all of us. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so, so Bradley, is this the thing that you were talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah, this is the thing I was talking yeah, about. So, so this was something that um, like me and my wife were discussing for a long time, but like I could get it to work in the last couple of, not couple of days, uh, in the last four or five days. So this is something that like, okay, so I'll start from the bottom. So like the data sets that we have, essentially the videos, like they are essentially just video files. So the video files, they basically shot on like, I don't think they're shot on seven frames per second, but the files are compiled in seven frames per second. So when you play them, they play out uh, like, all, we get only seven frames per second, but we could actually interpolate them and we could have smoother, smoother videos using current, uh, some new approaches. But in general, those approach like video interpolation algorithms in general are very slow, but if like we could also use some deep learning based methods which could be used here and like i don't know if the video is visible can you guys see the video yeah. Yeah. yeah so i don't think the frame rate difference is apparent here but i'll share the video i'll share the video soon in the chat so there the frame rate difference would be apparent so the video to the left it's playing in seven frames a second but the video to the right it's it, it it's playing in 60 frames a second so essentially it's the same data but it's actually interpolated to have more frames per second. So that's something me and Bradley were, were discussing and maybe we could go further on this to expand the current data sets because more frames equals to more data. So I guess that's something which would be which would be useful for the community. Great. So yeah. We were actually talking about this with uh, Thomas uh, Herbick about the Basel area data and he has a problem with synchronizing the frames um, I don't know if it's the same thing, but you know we have like this. It's, the, it doesn't the frames aren't sampled at a regular interval or something like that, and so you know maybe trying to find a fix. Yeah, a way to get so, around that. Yeah. Okay, so what I wanted to add here is that like what the model is basically doing. It's actually based on this paper over here. Uh, I'll I'll send these links in the chat. So if 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 anybody wants to check it out, they could check it out. So the work is basically based on code from this paper. I had to refactor their code. And what this is doing is basically, it's taking seven frames and it's actually interpolating them into 60 frames, like while retaining the data itself. Like it doesn't form any unnecessary artifacts. Like the, the data there is intact, but it has more frames. That's the advantage here. And as you can see, the video is way smoother on the right side. So like, uh, yeah. why, is it using some sort of CAS network, like how, like I understand that you are making 7 frames into a 60 frames, like by uh, basically predicting the frames between 2 frames, 1 and 2, for yeah. example. Yeah. So like, is it using some sort of GANs network, like how you are doing that? No, it's not actually a generative network, it's actually use it's C. It, it actually also has something called raft. Okay, so what that raft does is that it it's actually a very fast algorithm to, to uh, calculate the optical flow. So, yes. it's, so it actually takes the uh, so it actually takes the optical flow in between the frames. Plus, it takes the two frames as the input, the frame previous and the frame next to it. And it and it actually uses these three channels, and it tries to compute a frame in the middle. So that works uh, like it uh, like it 
it uses this algorithm and it uh, recursively finds out these new frames that we see to the right. So, so as you ask, it's it's not cans. It's okay, okay. Not can you please uh, can you please paste the link of the paper on the right yeah, hand? Sure, sure. Yeah. Actually, I wasn't planning to present this today. Anyways, oh. I'll <laughs> share yeah, sure, sure. Then I think it's an interesting paper, so I just want to read. Yeah, because these uh, data sets they are very choppy. Like the videos, if we look at them, it's very hard to find out anything using your naked eye because everything is so choppy and like it just goes by. And if it smoother, it's just more data. That's the way I see it. So maybe I could present on this in detail n n next week. So. It would be good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be sharing the links though. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so following up on something Oswald mentioned, so the, the coming weeks, uh, when we maybe next week we'll start, uh, you know, during the coding period, we usually have updates uh, by the students. So my knock would be giving a weekly update to the group on his progress. So it wouldn't have to be anything formal, just like, you know, we'll ask you, well, what do you, what did you do this week? And then you would summarize it. And I just wanted you to be prepared for that because we want to make sure that, you know, and this is something that I think that they recommend for GSOC in general, just kind of to, you know, if you do like a blog post, you might bring that to the meeting and say, this is basically walk, walk us through it, you know, and then maybe put a paper, you know, maybe if there's a paper you reference or there's a paper you found interesting like this one. I mean, next week you could maybe present this paper. We could talk about it. So yeah, uh, maybe I could do a walkthrough of the of the of the blog post, right? Yeah, that would be yeah, fine. that would be good. And I think that sure. would give us sure. a good idea. And then you know, um, and then you want to stay in touch with myself and Ujwal, uh to make sure that if you have any problems and my uh, and and my uh, as the maintainer of the uh, Diva Learn. So if you have any problems, if you have any big problems, like, you know, I can't get this thing to run or I need to, you know, move on to some other part of the project because something isn't working, then we, you know, we want to know about that and, and, and sort of solve that problem before you spend too much time on something. Um, these are just strategies that, like, you know, we found in the last couple of years, you know, people doing different projects, uh, you know, you might have a problem with, you know, computational resources, although, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's going to be too much of a problem, but, um, you know, maybe with some, something not working the way you'd want it. And so we want to make sure that, you know, that there's a, a time pressure thing here where you don't want to spend too much time on something banging your head against the wall. Um, and then, you know, at the end, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have some nice things to show. And um, so, yeah, in terms of the schedule the other thing i wanted to mention um the, your your evaluations are just going to be like maybe kind of formalities if you're if you stick with everything and you're making progress week to week and you you know you're doing the work then it's you know it's not that hard to you know pass your evaluation uh so we'll we'll uh you know that'll that'll be something you'll engage with us on as well as mentors and so that's good. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess, let's see, Dick asked if you could uh, put the URL for your blog in the chat. And then he also asked, can you extract waves of mitosis or cell size? And I don't know if that's like if, uh, well, I mean, you could use a diff uh, different method than I think what my, my knock was talking about in this particular paper, but I guess you could do that. I mean, you know, we, we haven't really, we've done, we focused a lot on segmenting cells, but we we also focused on segmenting feet, uh, what we called meta features last year. And so th these are things that aren't really cells, but they're kind of like things that you'll see in the video, you know, maybe features that we can define and pull out uh, that aren't necessarily cell boundaries. So, you know, maybe things that cross cell boundaries or, you know, groups of cells. So we might be able to do that. I haven't, we haven't really done the actual investigations of the, of some data on this, but um, that's kind of where we're trying to build towards. So. Um, yeah, I'll try to read about, uh, about the waves of my 
factors is that uh, that he was talking about like he he is asking about extracting waves of mitosis and i'm not actually sure what that is so i'll try to i'll actually read about it a bit more and i'll try to get that done. sure yeah yeah there um so that's yeah another thing too in with this project you know it does help so mitosis equals cell division so sometimes you'll see in the videos, you'll see like different things happening during cell division, um, you know, movements of cells. And um, there are other types of things going on. Like, I don't know if you'll observe calcium waves, but um, there are other types of like hypothesize that they're differentiation waves in embryos. And so trying to find, but, but those are all these sort of meta features where there are things that like, they happen between cells, across cells, rosettes form, yes. So you have a lot of things going on in the embryo, not just like independent cells. Cells divide, of course, but then they have other things where they're doing things collectively and you have different structures that form over time. And so, um, so another thing I would recommend for community period, but throughout is to, you know, if you find, I think we have in the onboarding guide, which I don't have up right now, we have uh, some bio, basic biology resources. So, and this goes for anyone in the group. If you have, if you find something, you don't know what it is, um, you know, ask maybe myself or Dick or Susan, they're biologists, you know, uh, and, you know, we, we, we can answer your question, but we also have some reference uh, reading materials you can follow up on. So, you know, if there's some problem, one of the things that has been a challenge, I think, for people who come from like a computer science background is that, you know, there are a lot of things in biology that you have to learn and they're kind of unfamiliar. So don't worry about like, if they're unfamiliar, we can help you find out what it is or, you know, you can read about, you know, we can find the resource that you need to read about more, read more about it. So. So this is the link and then side by side comparison of input and output. Notice the frame rate difference. This is the note on the paper that Mayak was, Mayak was talking about uh, previously. So there's this uh, thing that came up in the chat here. This is something that, well, thank you Mayak for that presentation, by the way. Uh, so this is something that Dick put in the chat. Yeah, Dick says vocabulary for a biology is greater than learning a new language. So in a lot of ways it's more challenging than learning a new language because uh, you have to, well, I mean, I guess in language learning, you have to learn the context and, and a lot of the background. But uh, yeah, biology is, is like this language on top of facts, on top of like observations. So it's really, uh, you know, a challenge to get it all in. Um, yeah. Susan says, this is often what I call Latinese. Okay. Oh, Jesse says, the screens aren't being shared for you, but I think it's my connection. Well, yeah, I don't know why that's... Uh, we haven't shared a screen in a little bit, but uh, yeah, it might be a problem. So Dick had this uh, comment here. Um, yeah, so we were talking before about like the time intervals and about... Um, sort of resampling the data, um, interpolation, that sort of thing. Uh, so let's see. Um, he says, and, all right, so, okay, it starts up here actually. So we were talking before about the Cyberworm project. Uh, nematodes present a unique opportunity for understanding morphogenesis and what might be, you know, uh, might be called a middle out manner from the cells and their interactions to the organism and from the cells down to the me uh, mechanochemical physics of the cytoskeleton and DNA. And this is something I think that involved Dick, but also um, a couple other people, okay, Kitano, et cetera. Yeah, so this was a thing from 1997. They would like to write a four-dimensional database simulation to be called Cyberworm. As a database, it would contain and accumulate coordinates cytoskeletal arrangements, cell division times, gene expression, and other data. So this is stuff that we've kind of uh, worked on in DevoWorm a bit. We've got some data for that, and, and we've cataloged it in a sort of data structure. Um, 
And so the four dimensions are the three dimensions of space and the one of time. But I think uh, you have other you have other dimensions as well that you can explore, um, like angle of division and other types of uh, derivatives that you can, uh, you know, build as dimensions into the, into a model uh, as a database. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, where was I? As a database, it would contain an accumulated coordinate, cytoskeletal arrangements, etc. Uh, rich color display mode would allow one or one to visualize these data in two, three, and four D. So then, you know, this kind of goes on about Cyberworm in the chat. If you want to follow along, uh, so this is something that was sort of proposed in '97. Um, it didn't. I don't know if there was a lot of progress made on it, but we obviously took a lot of that and. Uh, Realized some of it with Diva, Diva Worm. Um, Steve McGrew was involved, and he's been involved in Diva Worm. Um, yeah. Well, just a thought. <laughs> so this was, you know, this was early on with, this was well before, like, you know, machine learning was a thing. And uh, so this was, so they said uh, here, of course, it's dangerous to announce good intentions, but the statement points out that one possible direction future research on computer synthesis of embryos. Our goal is nothing less to compute a worm than to compute a worm, uh, though I suspect the full success is 10, 30 years away. So that was, this uh, was in, no, oh, maybe about 25 years ago now. So this was, uh, <laughs> so synthesizing a real worm would be the next step. And there's a citation, Wolpert, 1995A, which I don't know what that reference is, but this was, imagine, something about computing the worm. So we'll have to come across this paper, um, maybe review it at some point. And so, yeah, this is, uh, these are sort of the precursors of Diva Worm. Okay, so then that's great. Uh, so. I wanted to go on here. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up for people, and I, this is uh, something that I sent to my knock and I've sent out to people doing the community period. Um, you know, I've done community period for a number of years. And this is a resource that I have sort of put together over that time. So um, this is uh, something called Open Science and Open Source. It's a set of readings and I'll put the link in the chat. And I know a lot of you are interested in open si open source and maybe even open science. I don't know. Um, it, you know, maybe that uh, that set is smaller than the open source group. But uh, so, you know, your GSOC is basically a way to advance open source. And so I also put some things here on open science because Diva Worm does a lot of open science stuff. So this is a nice uh, collection of papers and books that uh, will kind of give you some ideas about like, you know, what kinds of things people are thinking about in these areas. Plus there's some data science stuff in here as well. So this uh, this one, for example, is a paper on producing open source software, how to run a successful free software project. And so this is a nice guide if you really want to know how like maybe to market your open source software or how to like sort of develop uh, the infrastructure. So a lot of this, if you're interested in DevaLearn, a lot of this is sort of stuff that we're doing to drive forward that initiative. So you have developer guidelines, communication channels, uh, version control, and bug tracker access. Um, they kind of, this was at the beginning of GitHub, so they kind of talk about GitHub in a very informal way here. Um, and then you know, kind of giving ideas about like what development should look like, all these things. Um, and then there's this book on open science, which is uh, a book called Open. And that kind of gives you an idea as to what open science is and how it relates to software and how it relates to uh, producing uh, papers and knowledge. So there's a lot here. I mean, these are really big books. 
So this is just a reference library for people if you're interested in these topics. Um, you know, you can look at it and just kind of skim through and find something you're interested in. This is the field guide to data science, which actually might be interesting. I know that Jesse in particular is interested in data science. Um, and so this is actually something that, you know, if you're interested in sort of what data science is and, and kind of going through some of this, um, you know, helping you through that process of sort of getting acquainted with it. This is a nice resource. Um, and then I have a number of topics here. So, you know, communities and collaboration, innovation, just information on licensing. So this is Ryan Merkley, who I think is still on the Open Room Foundation Board, uh, talking about attribution and, and licensing. So that's a very important part of software, uh, open source software production. Um, social media facilitates openness, working open and together. And these are some resources from like, in terms of working in teams and working on uh, team projects and things like that. So I, I, I give this out every year and I hope that people find it useful. I'll put it, I think I put this in the if you uh, are on, I think it's the GSOC Slack channel or the Devo Learn Slack channel, but I put it in there. So if you're interested, go take a look. Well, here's the Wolpert reference. And uh, so that's uh, development. Is the egg computable or could we generate an angel or a dinosaur? So that's the reference there. And then uh, let's see, my next said about the video interpolation thing I showed. I'm not sure if the output video is viable to be used as data yet. Needs more work. We'll need feedback from the community. Yeah, that's that's fine. I mean, we can we can see what it looks like, and then you know, kind of pull data from it. it. You know, that's that's the first step, I guess, with something like that is to test the simulation and see how it works, and then we can figure that out. That's fine. Um, and then Ujwal has to leave early. Well, thank you, Ujwal, for attending. Yeah. So. Um, so that's that. And if you're interested again in that, um, in reading more about this stuff, let me know. Um, and then now I want to go to our, actually, I should ask, does anyone else want to present or say anything about, um, I don't know if anyone had anything to discuss. Uh, hello? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so I actually wanted to ask, like, uh, I pinged you, like, a couple of days back regarding the data set uh, for my, uh, for the project I was doing, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, is it, uh, would it be provided, like, the entire... Uh, uh, I, yeah, I've been trying to work on getting the whole thing up. Um, I don't know if we, well, I'll have to see what we can do, because it's, it's pretty big. If I could uh, just, I don't know, maybe we could just do subsets at a time because it's a lot of data yeah. to sort of put out and... And, uh, and the images like in the paper is totally different from the ones in the data set. So like it's not as clean and I, I don't know, like, is it going to be the same throughout the data set like uniform or... So this was the uh, ax axolotl or the... Yeah, the axel axel Okay. So maybe Susan can talk, speak to that. Hi. Hi. Hello. Yeah, sorry to ask that, so ask that again. Um, yeah, so uh, the data set like provided to me, like, I, I got the sub data set like uh, provided by Bradley. Uh, I went through it and the images are like, uh, I, I don't know, it looks the same. I, I mean, it, it's just the white blob in the center and there's nothing much else. Like, there's just light coming from different directions and uh, um, uh, it, it totally looks different from the paper uh, you have published, co-authored, uh, like regarding that uh, 4D embryo region is reconstruction, reacquisition. I guess that's the paper's title. I'm not sure. I have to go through that. Um, yeah, so uh it, like in the paper those images are uh, so clean uh, is, is it going to be that clean in the data set as well uh, like um i thought they were similar i 
No, uh, they don't look so similar. Uh, they don't look? Oh, no. okay. Some of the images were better than others, but I, um, you saw my ball microscope, did you? Yeah, the ball, the ball microscope, uh, the, no, the, I'm talking about the data set, like the images captured yeah, by the... I'm, what I'm going to say is I'm going to try to get a new data set. Okay, okay, that's cool. That's really cool. Okay. Yeah, okay. so that this will clear some of that up. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's really nice. So uh, if, if you could get some uh, Im images like the ones in the paper you published, it would be like uh, great. Uh, yeah. Okay, because so. uh, some of them, yeah, some of the images are better than others and I'm hoping, well, I, I've just finished um, my last course or I have to do a presentation and then I'll be done my last course so I can work on other things after after this week I hope yeah sure okay. sure yeah so uh, maybe we'll uh, have it like j just like uh, if, if you are there on slack you can uh, send it in the channel or you can just send it to Bradley who would just forward it to me oh okay yeah all yeah. right I think I do I have your email? I might have. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I have actually sent you an email, uh, but I, I'll just send, send it in the chat as well. So. Yeah. Well, it's um, I was finishing up my mechanics course, and it's um, kind of a heavy duty course. I just wrote a ten thousand word essay. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, I've I've been kind of snowed under. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that's going well, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I finished it, so that's that's helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. And so, yeah, that's so. I'm, I, I'd like to move on to uh, our submissions document just to see where we are with that. Um. So. This is again our submissions document, and uh, having—I don't know if we've made a, a lot of changes in the past week or two weeks, I guess. Um, so we have a couple of outstanding things. We have a lot of these. So these uh, different submissions to Networks 2021 are still ongoing, and we'll be getting those out. Uh, let's see the poster the. For net neuro, that has a deadline of like the 23rd. So that has to be, you know, sort of uh, designed by then and submitted. So that, that isn't too hard. I mean, we can just kind of put that together and exchange notes in Slack. Um, uh, let's see, we have a uh, couple of things. Uh, we have the Kindle book, The Boring Billion, Mathematics of Diva Worm. These are all just sort of open. Um, the Williams Williamson Symbiosis Test. Uh, this is, again, if this is something you have experience with, like, you know, analyzing genomes, this might be something you'd be interested in uh, participating in. Also, some of the things with diatom motion, that's still open. Um, we actually have two things here. We have molecular level simulations, and then we have the movement of the actual cells, whether or not smooth or jerky, which is like basically calculating the, the movement or, or like the, the position and then, you know, the momentum and, the, and, and then even higher level derivatives from that, uh, which they call jerkiness or, you know, whether it's smooth, you can approximate the movement with you know, lower dimensional movement parameters or higher dimensional movement parameters, that sort of thing. Um, and then this uh, this is an abstract that uh, I'm going to be submitting for uh, today for Dynamics Days Europe. Uh, this is game theory and developmental processes. This is something that has been an open paper in, on, in the list of open papers for a while. And I just decided to pull up, uh, put together an abstract for this. And so this is something that's going to be submitted to a conference called Dynamics Days. It's going to be virtual, and it's it's about uh, applying game theory to developmental processes. So uh, this kind of goes through the um, typo there. Um, kind of goes through game theory as applied to 
development uh, going through some games that uh, you you know you might be able to apply to development and some issues of sort of the agent the player of the game so these are things that i mean hopefully this is sort of a dynamical systems approach uh but also a game theoretic approach so it's it's an interesting way to look at uh, development we i did a we did a little bit of this in in we had this uh paper in 2018 on the cybernetic embryo and so that paper actually kind of previews some of what's going to be in this talk so um just to let people know if you want to be involved I'll, I'll probably pull up I'll probably put together the slides like I think the conference is later and maybe in the early fall so we'll, we'll have time to put together the slides on that for people to be involved um, so finally I wanted to talk about uh, papers I see people have left here so I don't know what, what we'll talk about here I did want to uh, show this uh so this is uh the early uh, uh thing on early zebrafish development and this is uh zebrafish rock it's a twitter uh account that does a lot of like zebrafish embryos and things like that they have a lot of nice videos and and uh gifs and things like that of the process so i can't i don't know if i'm going to be able to get this uh video to play and i have it in the folder but this is the first 22 hours of zebrafish development in one minute. So they've taken this observation of an embryo for 22 hours and they've, they've condensed it into a one minute video. So it's a time lapse and in, in, in the time lapse, you'll see like things start to develop from this. So this is the, uh, this is like the cell mass. This is like an outer area. And then I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the terminology here that they use, but eventually you'll start to get like this is enveloped and then you start to get the something that looks like the zebra fish so i don't know if i can play it. oh maybe i can okay here we go so you can see the process here you start to get cells out here that are dividing and now it's start yeah it's, it's starting to become a single thing with a bunch you can see the cells here and you can see this it sort of looks like a wave here and then now you're starting to get some shape into the embryo and now the outer edge is starting to form separate from the inner part here and this actually starts to look like a zebra fish out here on the edge So this is over the course of 22 hours, we're almost at the end. Okay, so that's 22 hours of zebrafish development. And we have uh, in the uh, one of the latest papers we've put out on uh, comparing zebrafish and C. elegans, in that paper there's a reference to uh, a reference database that gives you all of the different stages of zebrafish development and the timing and all that. So, okay, so in the chat, Okay, so we have, okay, so I need to add something here. Dick said, uh, add quantitative comparison of archaea and shape droplets. So that was something I think we talked about. Um, I think, like, with respect to this um, submission, this uh, thing that's going on for networks, the topo nets. So maybe applying topo nets. Uh, and then this, we don't know where we're going to submit this. Uh, maybe, like, let's see. Um, tie into topo nets, maybe. Maybe what we learn at that session will be informative here. But we have this, basically this, uh, these archaea bacteria that have different shapes. And then droplets also have shapes. And maybe we can characterize them in different ways. Um, I don't know. I'll fix that later. Anyways, yeah. yeah. Bradley, the first step is going to be segmentation of images of all sorts of different qualities. Okay, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of images in the literature, but the quality varies tremendously. 
Yeah, <laughs> that's the problem we've had with uh, some of the original data we were using for the uh, uh, diatoms is that people create videos that are very different in, in terms of their quality and, and the way they're captured. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, okay, let me go back to the papers then. Um, so that was the zebrafish development. Uh, so let's see, what do we want to talk about today? Okay, we'll talk about this. So this is actually, if we go back uh, several months, there's a special issue of uh, Philosophical Transactions B on, um, it's sort of on what they call uh, sort of cellular decision-making um, and non neuronal cognition. So this is the Michael Levin paper uh, with one of his colleagues. And this paper is called The Cognitive Lens, uh, Primer on Conceptual Tools for Analyzing Information Processing and Developmental and Regenerative Morphogenesis. So they take the view that development can be viewed as information processing, much like we view cognition and hence the cognitive lens. So the, the uh, abstract here is that brains exhibit plasticity, multi-skill integration of information, computation and memory, um, having evolved by specialization of non-neuronal cells that already possessed many of the same molecular components and functions. So they're talking about neurons and maybe things that support neurons, but all of those really uh, differentiated from uh, or evolved from non-neuronal cells. So for example, you have non-neuronal cells and sponges that express uh, synaptic proteins. And you have other cells that maybe there are, you know, uh, stem cells that um, express a lot of the things that are gonna be later needed for uh, for action potentials to be produced, a lot of the different uh, neurotransmitters and things like that. And so, you know, these things are just restricted to neuronal cells. Um, so the emerging field of basal cognition provides many examples of decision-making throughout a wide range of non-neuronal systems. So basal cognition is this idea that there's this, uh, you know, very basic uh, type of what they call cognition. And cognition, of course, refers to, I guess originally it referred to like sort of a, a machine or, you know, cogs in a machine that are driving some process. So, you know, cognition, that word, it sort of denotes a sort of uh, goal-oriented machine that produces some output. I think, you know, in cognitive science, you learn that like the brain is operates like a computer or it's a computer of some type. And so that's, that's the sort of thing. And so we're extending that analogy to cells and basal cognition is just simply that we're doing this without a brain. We're not doing this with like a lot of intention. It's just that there's this basic information processing that happens um, in these systems. So then the question is how can biological information processing across scales of size and complexity be quantitatively characterized and exploited in biomedical settings. Uh, we, we use pattern regulation as the context in which to introduce the cognitive lens. So that the cognitive lens is a strategy using well-established concepts from cognitive and comp computer science to complement mechanistic investigations in biology. Um, to facilitate the assimilation and application of these approaches, we review tools from various quantitative disciplines so that includes dynamical systems, information theory, and what they call least action principles, uh, which are sort of like energy minimization. Um, you may have heard of uh, something called uh, the free energy principle, which is uh, base, you know, one version of the least action principles. Um, so we propose that these tools can be extended beyond neural settings to predicting control systems level outcomes and understand biological patterning as a form of primitive cognition. So that's an interesting view of that. Uh, we don't really think about biological patterning in that way. We think of it, we, well, we talked about the um, reaction diffusion models of chemical morphogenesis. We've talked about, um, you know, uh, sort of cellular automata, which are these emergent models where you have a lot of interactions and it produces this thing. But they're actually arguing that there's another component to this 
and it's this idea of primitive cognition that uh, contributes in some way. We hypothesize that a cognitive level information processing view of these functions can complement reductive perspectives, which is what you know, people have talked about reductionism, which is looking at component, you know, the parts and their components and their components in isolation. So you can do like controlled experiments, but of course you don't get the information about what's going on at the system. Level. Um, exploration of the deep parallels across diverse quantitative paradigms will drive integrative advances in evolutionary biology, regenerative medicine, bioengineering, and artificial intelligence. So this is uh, so this is the paper, and uh, there's here's a figure where they talk about sort of they lay out this vision. Um, they show normal embryonic development. Uh, they show an example of a genetic regulatory network where you go from genes to proteins to some physics and then to emergence. And then they have a little uh, wand, magic wand here over emergence, which is kind of a play on, you know, a lot of people think emergence is kind of like magic. It's, it's you know, it's a joke, but um, still you go from genes to proteins to this physics, which is sort of a black box here, and then emergence, which is a bigger black box of the wand over it. And then you get this organism. So that's, that's an open loop view of pattern formation. So open loop meaning that there isn't like this uh, closed loop feedback. It's not just reliant on closed loop feedback. There's probably a lot of feedback in this, especially in GRNs um, between different genes, as you can see this loop here, or even in the physics, but you don't get this, uh, you know, you don't have this tightly regulated closed loop. And then they showed some other, so they showed the information processing here where, uh, you know, you have the same model as you do with the GRN, but now you have these information processing feedbacks. So now you have, you go from genes to proteins, to physics, to emergence, to this organism, but then the organism encounters unpredictable environments. And then the information from that goes back to, to regulating genes or affecting the physics. And so then that's that's the information processing step. Um, and then this is the computational cognitive complexity. So this is, of course, where you have uh, behavior, and that can be active or non-active or passive. And then the active behavior is either purposeful or undirected. And if it's purposeful, which is a loaded word, uh, but they use it, if it's purposeful, then you have these two things here, supervised with feedback and unsupervised node feedback. And so this is the idea of either you're getting information processing feedback or not. And if you are, then there's this uh, predictive versus non-predictive um, distinction, which means you can extrapolate or you can't extrapolate. And extrapolate means, I guess, extrapolate from the environment. So there's this predictive aspect. And then this is where you get into the cognitive um, realm because cognition is a lot of times about prediction and predicting things. Um, so this is the predictive step and then there's this next step. If it's predictive, it can be different types of predictive. So it can be first order, second order, or whatever. This is like, you know, if you're thinking about like predictions, thinking about thinking about predictions and so forth. So if you're just kind of thinking about, you know, if you're just making a prediction, you might predict that some uh, something is over there in the environment versus over here. But a second order prediction would be thinking about that prediction and improving upon it. So, and of course, you know, we can't say that cells think, but they do have these mechanisms for feedback. So they, and they use this example, of course, of flatworms, which is Michael Levin's model system to show so, how some of this works with regeneration. Um, so that's, Let's see if there are any more nice pictures in here. Um, oh, they just kind of get into some of these tools. Uh, so this is mapping between various tools. And this is kind of like, we kind of think about like, you know, how to link things we know from cognition, like decision making and memory, and allostasis, homeostasis, adaptation and learning. These are called cognitive phenomena. And then you map those to determine it, what they call deterministic tools, which are either dynamical or algorithmic. So the dynamical tools are 
from dynamical systems theory. So it could be attractors or ultra stability or feedback or back propagation, feedback control, I'm sorry. Or it could be algorithmic. So you have Komolgorov complexity and algorithmic dynamics. And so you have these tools that map to these phenomena. And then there are these statistical tools, which is the third realm, that allow you to um, sort of, you know, kind of make maybe uh, tease out some of the predictions or looking at how predictions are made in these systems. So you have things like Bayesian inference and variational free energy and mutual information. And so all those, you can use those tools and they're just methods to analyze, uh, for, to look and see if their predictions being made and how well they map to what's predicted. So you have maybe what's observed in the system versus what you might predict using one of these statistical models. Or you have one of these, you know, you have say a cell making a bunch, uh, you know, behaving as it does. And then looking at, you know, saying, well, this is something that, you know, this is an experiment we can show that the organism has a memory or that it's adapting or it has, it's making decision-making uh, decisions. And we can map these to observational tools like uh, an attractor basin or, you know, back propagation uh, technique to sort of, sort of uh, validate these things as, as behaviors. So that's that paper. And I want to put this link to the papers in the chat. Actually, we have a bunch of comments here. So let me go back to the comments. So, um, Okay, this is just sharing emails. Um, Janus face causality not included. Yeah, we talked about Janus faced uh, um, mechanisms a couple weeks ago. Susan says, I should give a presentation on the physics part of this. Yes, Susan, please, if you have time, uh, please do so. And then uh, Dick put some, oh, this is the citation for the uh, Janus face causality paper. Well, both of these are. So if you're interested in this, go ahead and check those out. And here's the link to the drive. And we'll do one more paper before we go today. And uh, that will be this one here. Symmetry Transformations in Metazoan Evolution and Development. So this is a paper in the journal Symmetry. Um, and the abstract reads as such. In this review, we consider transformations of axial symmetry, metazoan evolution, and development. The genetic basis and phenotypic expression of different axial body plans. And in addition to the main symmetry types in metazoan body plans, such as rotation, so there's radial symmetry, which is where you have uh, symmetry around a, a radial organization. So you have like fourfold and eightfold symmetry and so you can think of that as being around a, in a circle. Uh, you also have reflection, which is mirror and glide reflection symmetry. And then, and this is like maybe bilateral symmetry. And then translation, which is metamerism, and I'm not sure what that is. But I guess it's like you can, you translate from one side to another and it's symmetrical. Uh, Bradley, yeah. metamerism, repetition of unit like the uh, backbone. Oh, okay, okay. So this is another form of symmetry then. Okay. So this is, yeah, this it's is... Translate, it's kind of a translational symmetry. Okay. Okay. So that's, a, okay, that's what that is. So those are your different types of uh, things in metazoan body plans. Many biological objects show scale, fractal symmetry, as well as some symmetry type combinations. Uh, some genetic mechanisms of axial pattern establishment creating a coordinate system of the metazoan body plan, bilateral segmentation and left-right symmetry, asymmetry are analyzed. So they kind of go through some of these, um, they create a coordinate system for some of these types of symmetry here in the paper. Uh, data on the crucial co contribution of coupled functions of the WINT, uh, BMP, notch, and hedgehog signaling pathways. So these are, uh, these pathways are important for uh, a lot of differentiation in the embryo. And so you get hedgehog and notch, BMP and Wnt, and they all work and they all do a lot of signaling to cells. These are in, of course, um, not in C. elegans so much, but in a lot of the, um, like say for example, um, 
mammalian or um, other types of embryos that are not um, C. elegans. So you get that sort of signaling. So these signaling pathways are designed according to the abbreviated or full names of genes or protein products and the axial HOX codes. We talked about HOX codes uh, I think a couple weeks ago and these have to do with uh, different genes in this family of genes that are sort of collinear on the on the chromosome that are sort of physically adjacent and they map to different uh, segments. So like segments of the backbone, for example, uh, or segments of the body would have their own Hox gene and each Hox gene would regulate those segments. So that's what they mean by Hox code in the formation and maintenance of the metazoan body plans. This is necessary for an understanding of evolutionary diversification and phenotypic expression of these various types of symmetry. The lost body plans of some extinct Edicarian and early Cambrian metazoans are also considered in comparison with axial body plans and posterior growth in living animals. So they kind of get go back again to that those very early um, body plans and very early embryos that we talk we've been talking about off and on for a number of weeks. Um, so they talk about symmetry being the basic feature of what they call the ball plan or the body plan for different metazoan groups. Clades is just another word for like a phylogenetic group. Um, symmetry of biological structures can be defined as a repetition of parts in different positions and orientations to each other. So you have these different types of uh, symmetry, uh, but also many biological ob objects show scale or fractal symmetry. So it means that there's that there are things going on at different scales of organization that are very similar. Um, so this author considered asymmetrical, spherical, cylindrical, and radial and bilateral symmetry as main types of symmetry in metazoan and body plans. So these are like takeoffs on the, um, on the, you know, basically if you have bilateral symmetry or, or radial symmetry, these are different versions of this. And so, well, they talk about bilateral here directly, but you have other types of uh, symmetry, especially radial symmetry. Um, the author reason that the particular cases of rotational and reflectional symmetries are sufficient for biologists Although more general theory of organism geometry would require other types of symmetries, for example, translation or helicoidal symmetry to be investigated. So they're kind of taking from like the mathematical world of symmetry and they're using those uh, ideas and tools to sort of bring some uh, insight into what you see in the animal world. And so uh, such complex symmetry types as combinations of radial and bilateral symmetry are common in some cnidarians, uh, bilateral and, and pentaradial symmetry in echinoderms, and bilateral and spiral or helical symmetry were also considered. And so, uh, metazoan and body plans combine well-defined primary, secondary, and in many bilaterians, tertiary body axes. And so, you know, Symmetry isn't just a matter of what's going on with respect to the sort of the midline or there, you know, different axes in the organism where you see very clearly where the symmetry is playing out. Um, you know, not all organisms are completely symmetrical. Our bodies, for example, are not completely symmetrical. There are some asymmetries in like the heart or in some of the organs. And so that's something that, you know, there are other, also other axes of symmetry in the organism. So this is something that they're trying to explore as well. Um, and so this is an example here of uh, a scheme of body symmetry transformation in planarians. So this is this flatworm again that we saw with Michael Levin's work. And uh, so this is the scheme for body symmetry. You have an intact planaria here, which is the entire flatworm. And then you have this two-headed bipolar form, which is what happens when you cut off like the back end of the planaria. And you can actually either, um, you can, well, they regenerate, like they can regenerate from a single cell, but they can regenerate another head here. Um, and then, so you have a two-headed bipolar form, and then you have this hypercephalized, rad radicalized form, um, 
here in C, which is where you have a bunch of heads, I guess, coming off of a common bud. And then uh, B and C are beta catenin and knocked down with RNAi. So this is when you knocked out certain genes in the uh, worm and they generate these different types of body plans. And in this case, you're going from sort of a bilateral symmetry to a bilateral symmetry, like a twofold bilateral symmetry, and then this radial symmetry where the head is just kind of poking out in different directions, different heads. So it actually has, I think, five or six heads here in this drawing. And so this is all based on just knocking out a specific gene in the in the genetic code. So this, this paper goes on. This is, uh, they go on and they talk about some of the other things that they investigated. Um, I was wondering if they had any other images. This is another image here where they have the correlation and direction of the blastomere displacement during the third division of a cleavage and shell twisting in the pond snail, uh, Laminea. So this is where you have in the embryo, you have these uh, blastomeres and they're being displaced in, during this period of cleavage. And then this corresponds to shell twisting in this uh, shell. So you have this process and development of twisting and then you can observe this twisting in the cell and this is, you know, this is a, a symmetry transformation, at least the way they're viewing it. Um, then you have this fractal colonial organization. So this is, um, this is a, a fractal colonial organization of the rhizocephalin barnacle uh, inside the host crab. So this barnacle here actually grows in this, uh, around in this way, it's a fractal structure. It looks like a, a plant root kind of, but it's a fractal growth pattern. And this is, of course, a, a very complex form of symmetry where you have these fractal branching patterns um, is the main uh, mode of growth. So they have these trophic roots here. Um, and this is these are antenatal genetic changes in morphology and fractal dimension value for spinal neurons. So this is in the cherry salmon, and this is these are after the first and second year of fish life. So you can see that the, in the first year, the neurons are less branched, and in the second year, they start to get more branches. So you can see that there's this fractal dimension that they consider uh, as a form of uh, symmetrical transformation. So, and then again, you have these type of uh, radial symmetry um, situations, formation of the gastrovascular system in, um, in this organism during early ontogenesis. This is uh, a medusa. So it has this radial symmetry and it has this sort of structure. This is the center point of the symmetry. So you have different, um, you have different segments that come out like this from the center. So you have four, I guess, fourfold symmetry here. And these are not necessarily identical, but they basically have the same sort of uh, plan. So you have like the same sort of blueprint, if you want to use that word, and you apply it four times in rotation. So you end up with this pattern. And then finally, we have this natural branching pattern of four channels in the same organism. Um, this is branching from the center point that comes out, and then they're able to map it to a, a presentation of what they call a fractal tree. So these fractal trees are mathematical tools that they can use to look at these bifurcations uh, in this branching system here. So it's it's radially symmetric. It's, it's this fourfold symmetry, but you can actually model this using a fractal tree. And the lengths of the branches have some relevance to their function. And you can actually look at how these branches occur and they occur across. So these branches aren't uniform across each of these symmetries, but they basically have a similar structure, but it's not identical. So that's, uh, in the, I mean, the paper is a little bit longer than that. It has a lot of information in it. So if you're interested, check it out. So finally, uh, let's see, we have a lot of things in the chat here, I think. Um, I think Dick posted a couple things. 
he posted some things on the theory of Hox genes. So these are some papers on that. Uh, Shirdi says, can we talk? Yeah, so Shirdi and Dick will talk, I think. Did they miss phylotactic uh, sym symmetries? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't, I, they may have, but I'm, I didn't read the whole paper. I just kind of went through, but they may, may not have considered that. Sinat also has a checkerboard symmetry. So Sinat is an author. I think Sinat works with plants. Um, yeah. And so there's also checkerboard symmetry. Fractal pattern shown is not self-similar. So that's, yeah, I don't know what, why that's, why they have it like that. Uh, best botany book. So this is Plant Morphogenesis by Sinat. So this is something that, you know, also has a lot of things about symmetry in it. And, in plants specifically. So, okay, well, uh, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, if people have things that they wanna present, maybe next week or the week after, let me know. We can uh, arrange to have time to do that. Um, yes, have a great weekend. If you don't have anything else, uh, any other questions, uh, see you next week. I'll be in Slack or you can email me. Okay, bye. I'll okay. probably email you that Susan okay. here. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Have a good week. Okay. Thanks.